Good afternoon, everyone. And um, thank you so much for making time to be with us. We're honored to be hosting the artist Abhishek Singh today for an artist talk called Drawing as a Language. Um, we'll start with Abhi speaking for a bit and showing some sketchbooks, but uh, feel free to participate all through the talk with us today by putting your questions in the chat field. Um, before we jump into the talk, I do want to do a little bit of housekeeping. And um, part of that is to explain the reason why we're gathered this, this afternoon is um, Asia Society Texas in 2014 organized an exhibition called Transcendent Deities of India. And we're delighted that the exhibition had an opportunity to travel to the Carlos Museum as part of Emory University in Atlanta. And this is the closing weekend for the exhibition there. Uh, the exhibition features the work of Raja Ravi Varma, Manjuri Sharma, and of course, today's guest, Abhishek. Um, we'll be having this artist talk this afternoon and hope that you will also tune in tomorrow to hear the collector Anubhav Nath talk about the um, Varma prints. We'll drop that link in the chat so that you can connect to that. It's tomorrow afternoon. Um, and that's hosted by the Carlos Museum. Programs like this, of course, are only possible because of the wonderful generosity of our donors at Asia Society Texas. And exhibitions and their related programs here are presented by Nancy C. Allen and Leslie and Brad Booker. Major support comes from Chin Hee Jun and Eddie Allen and Mary Lawrence Porter, as well as the Brown Foundation the Hearst Foundation, the Houston Endowment, and the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance. Generous funding is also provided by the Anchorage Foundation of Texas, the Clayton Fund, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Wortham Foundation, all of Jenny and Ann Wales. United Airlines is our official airline partner, and funding is also provided through contributions from the Exhibitions Patron Circle, a dedicated group of individuals and organizations committed to bringing exceptional visual art to our audiences. Um, one, one more comment, if I could make it, about uh, the wonderful generosity of the community around Asia Society Texas, is when people say yes, when we ask them the favor of loaning their artwork to exhibitions. And one of the lenders to Transcendent Deities, who I hope is tuning in, has a birthday today. So happy birthday, Vani. <laughs> We really hope that you're with us and thank you again for being part of the Transcendent Deities exhibition. I also would like to thank my colleagues, Chris Dunn and Alana Rubin for all of the work they do behind the scenes to make these programs possible for you to join us. And um, before I pass the baton to Abhishek, I also want to comment on the fact that today is the first day of Navratri and uh, a very important observance is beginning um, throughout the world, and that'll be a part of our conversation as well. So with no further ado, um, Abhi, please, please jump in. Thank you, Briz Bridget, and thank you everyone for joining in. And uh, without any further delays, <coughs> I'm going to jump right in. And uh, because the days of the goddess for the nine, next nine days, we'll observe goddess, but, you know, through stories and through intentions and uh, through the philosophies, you know, she, uh, she reverberates with. So I'm going to dedicate the, the starting of this presentation to some of the storytellers, which is some, all these stories which have been passed on to us from our grandmothers, from parents, from trees, from flowers, from children. It doesn't matter where the story comes from, but, you know, the story kind of shapes you like Ganesha was shaped by Parvati. In, and she made him through the clay of the earth. So he must be everything which the earth is. So I have these sketches, uh, which I had kind of opened up to share with you. And I guess for me, it would be <clears throat> immersing back in those memories and, re and reminiscing those stories and hopefully seeking the lessons again and, and trying to see some of the finer points as life has moved on and I can or probably learn a few more things from those stories again and uh, and bring them in a little more closer into the life. And these are some of the other sketches. So in the tradition of stories, let me start with the story. And it's the story about the mother goddess, uh, the mother to Ganesha, the elephant god. And one day <laughs> she told Ganesha, and while I will tell you that story, I'll also keep scrolling through the sketchbook uh, 
it's full of sketches uh, I made when I was volunteering with the elephants. Uh, elephants are magical beings. They have very, very beautiful long range hearing. They can hear a raindrop drumming inside a cloud from miles away. So when you're actually drawing uh, close to an elephant, they can maybe, and I'm sure that they can hear the bounce of the pen on the sheet of paper. So what you're drawing becomes music in their, in their mind, in their heart. So, so Parvati and Ganesha, has, they, they have this beautiful bond of mother and son. And one day Parvati uh, tells Ganesha to go out and whatever he was learning, uh, to go out and teach that to whoever he would meet on the way. Just, you know, share what you have. So Ganesha says, I have a lot of knowledge and I would like to share that. Uh, it was a free pass from her, uh, from his mom to uh, give him a choice to whatever he wanted to share. But he chose to share his knowledge, right? We all know Ganesha has written, he has a great and deep interest in literature. So he goes out and he, the first uh, being he finds is, uh, is a dog. And uh, this is a retelling of a classic story. So I've added a little bit of my, you know, spin on it. So he says, I'm going to teach you something very profound and you must repeat after me. And the dog is just looking at Ganesha that who's this person suddenly who strapped me and I was on my way to just enjoy this beautiful day. And now I have to sit through this lesson in some kind, some kind of a thing and it's, I'm forced into this schooling. And then Ganesha says, okay, repeat after me. I'm going to teach you something beautifully spiritual and say, oh, and the dog you know, takes a pause and says, bow. And he just barks back gently. And Ganesha gets a little bit, you know, surprised. He said, okay, maybe you, I need to say it again. So he says, you know, repeat after me, oh. And then dog again says, bow. And now Ganesha is a little angry and he says, I'm teaching you something so beautifully profound and you're you know, disrespecting it by not repeating after me. What is this? So I'm giving you one last chance and repeat after me. Oh, and the dog says, bow again. And now Ganesha gets really infuriated and he slaps the dog and the dog nose starts to bleed and the dog gets scared and he runs away. And Ganesha says, what am I even doing? You know, teaching all these, you know, low caliber students and people who don't want to understand all these beautiful, profound, spiritual things. And he, he, he stops that mission of sharing his knowledge and he just goes back. But when he goes back and enters his house, he sees that Mother Parvati, his mom, is bleeding. So he goes close to her and he's startled by this, by this sight and he says, Mother, why are, you, why are you bleeding? What happened to you? Who hurt you? And then she says, when you went out, did you hurt someone? Did you hurt a small creature, an innocent being? And he says, yes, but I simply wanted to share my knowledge. As you said, share what I have. And then Ganesha realizes, and the mom tells Ganesha that all those beings are part of me. If you hurt anyone out there, they carry the same divine essence as I have. And if you slap them, and if you hurt them, and if they bleed, I shall bleed with them. And I am wounded because you would inflict a wound on a creature outside just because you want to force what you know on them. Then Ganesha takes a moment and, and he realizes that mother, if they are your part, then they must know all the profound things you are about. They must also know all the knowledge you have actually given me and imparted me. And Parvati smiles and says, nothing. And Ganesha understands that all those creatures already have that beautiful knowledge like the elephant has, like the whales have like the flowers have. The flowers not going door to door and saying, smell me, I'm so fragrant, you know? And Ganesha realizes this and he becomes humble. And he says, it's not that I must pass my knowledge to them. The whole idea and the whole lesson there was to learn from them. So Ganesha goes into that deep silence again outside and finds dog and says, teach me what you know. And that's the end of the story. And it continues as Ganesha goes on to this adventure of learning little, little things about every being of this planet. And he ends up discovering so many beautiful things on top of already what he knows that when he's writing Mahabharata, when, he write, when he's writing the great literature, 
all he all, his best capacity there was to listen acutely to every word with the precision that he can inscribe it as he's listening with the speed as he's listening but also imbue it with that affection towards the creatures he's writing on behalf of so well with that story i have kind of come halfway through the sketchbook and the sketchbook uh, has a lot of these images of these two elephants my favorite elephants one is suzi and uh, one is asha suzi is blind she was rescued from the circus and she follows asha and these are the two caregivers uh, one of them has uh, recently passed away may his soul rest in peace and the beautiful story here is that one is a muslim and one is a hindu and they both are connected by the elephants in the same in the same story so uh Abhi, can I'm you tell stop here. for the audience can you share a little background of how you first came to encounter the elephants how these sketches came uh came forward so uh it's it may sound <laughs> a little uh, uh you know abstract but uh, i i was i i think a lot of my work i was creating uh you know elements of nature in the work and i had this intuitive uh i had this intuitive connection towards nature which i was bringing and manifesting in my works and paintings and then i was uh, going to the mountains uh, like i've been going to the himalayas for about close to a decade now and it's it's sort of my spiritual home uh, i've learned a great deal from the silence you know things you read in the story and things you intellectually and you know grasp you you only understand them uh, in when you let go of that and you go towards a completely different uh, you know aura when you go towards a completely different direction um when you're not painting not writing not doing anything at least that's what made sense to me to completely go away from everything so i can look at what i was doing and one of the realizations i had then that even though i was trying to uh, give a homage to nature in my work creatively i did not have enough hands on understanding and i did not really know much about what is actually going on with their lives whether it is the animals i was using whether it was the plants and the trees i was you know making use of in my work uh, and that sort of uh, made a big big uh, impact on me this realization and uh, one of the trips to the mountains and i was dreaming about elephants i was making them in my paintings uh and i was making them as part of nature or you know this these are the kind of premonitions you have and you don't know as an artist you know where do they fit they don't really fit a pragmatic uh a description they don't all imagination not necessarily fits a pragmatic you know bracket uh but you feel very strongly about these visions and dreams you are having uh but at the same time you may never go out and seek this in a way of what is actually going on with this creature which is you know such a recurring part of my work and then uh, so from the mountains i straight went i did a little bit of research of some of the centers which were working in elephant welfare conservation i worked with a couple of them i went down it was very hands on you have to uh, you know work with them uh, uh, like their physical making, care yeah the physical care and you know bunch of things like that and that kind of started me uh, on this path of coming closer and closer to actually what was going on with the elephants because uh it, i knew that they had tough lives i think somewhere or the other we all become numb about the pain and suffering of a lot of people around us um because i think we are trying to suppress that part i guess one of the big reason for that is we feel helpless that the if when i when at least i saw someone in a helpless place sometimes i feel how can i help this person because i i couldn't figure out a way to help and uh that helplessness eventually you know makes you a little jaded and eventually turns into a certain numbness and you just pass that uh but in the in the context of elephants for instance they're not supposed to be even walking on road because you know their their foot pads are not built to walk on concrete they develop arthritis they are chained for a large part of their life if they're domesticated if they're captive uh when they're rescued you know they have to their abscesses are not treated their sickness is not treated uh they have very very uh, <clears throat> you know uh, acute hearing very profound hearing and we are cra- you know bursting crackers next to them or we are you know uh, you know we are putting fire around them because of festivals like in jungle fire is a sign of danger but for human beings is a sign of celebration in some controlled manner so there's a lot of that 
thing which gets demystified and you start to look at i started to look at the work i was doing and i started to ask all these questions of when i am drawing ganesha uh, do i really know about the elephant or when i'm drawing the goddess do i really know about the tiger do when can i connect the two can i bring the story of the tiger as much as i'm wanting to bring these stories from the ancient tales and somehow a lot of that ecological intent kind of took over in my works uh, which was already intuitively there i was on a journey to you know uh, grasp a lot more layers about that in the process uh, and and develop this sweet bond with the creatures as well you know develop this this appreciation uh, for the creature without having creativity in between without having any kind of poetry in between just being in the moment doing some kind of service for them picking their <coughs> dung and cleaning their enclosures and cutting watermelon for them and a lot of times when people ask me so you know what did you seek what did you get after working with the elephants for such a long time i said i always say my fruit cutting skills are like a ninja now i can chop off like 20 watermelons in record time <laughs> because my favorite elephant loves the watermelon so mm -hmm. it's not that i can make oh i will make a beautiful drawing for this elephant and that she'll be happy no i want to be the best chef for her it's like that <laughs> 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 so it, it it changes the perspective uh so i've been very fortunate on that one well and i feel yeah. like you're such a unique artist because of this um relationship that you have with nature and the way that it comes across in the paintings and the drawings because i see that these trips the travels are in a way a part of your research process it, the way that you're gathering images around you it's almost like you're kind of charging a battery <laughs> that later comes out in the sketchbooks and everything else i i i don't i don't know i think when for me it's uh, for personally for me it's not research personally for me maybe it is incidental i think research is something which is just a parallel bonus i get but that's not my intention my intention is i'm in this world for a very short time and this world is made up of so many beings and so many other people and i have constantly read histories about human beings i've constantly seen animals being made captive but you know nature in itself has its own music and its own own history and has its own beauty and it's the same thing as seeing a tiger in a book you know or a you know elephant in a alphabet book but never seeing an elephant in real life and never having the you know the the experience of being you know uh, diving into how majestic that creature is in real life and uh, it's it's more a pursuit of curiosity and then it's more of a pursuit of connection i think in our times i think i i draw because i want to connect uh, not perhaps when other people connect with the work that's I, i'm saying that's again a bonus i consider that i'm very grateful that other people connect with the work but for me that's connecting with something because in a world what we are glancing through the world you know with not just in terms of now we have technology but that's been our default to just glance through the world we don't really spend time in seeing and sitting and focusing on anything uh, we don't sit uh, and and observe things and we find these perhaps one when you're a little older <clears throat> you know you watch the sky you you spend time sitting and observing things but when we are younger we are set in this we are very kinetic in general we are you know we our neurons are firing all over the place and we just want to move from one point to the other and in that our experience of stillness is limited so to bringing that experience of 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 stillness and what you're just passing every day even if it's if it's your own house it could literally be an electrical appliance just when you start to see it and how the light is you know hitting it and how it's creating this dance of shadows or what are the sounds in that moment it enriches your experience and because you're you endeavor to observe something and it enriched your experience it builds a certain uh, depth of meaning you know for you uh, and what you're experiencing and that that depth eventually transforms into either empathy or analysis or observation or poetry or art or or anything but it brings you into the moment it takes you away from the past it takes you away from your stresses of the future and it truly brings you into the now 
And that's the beautiful thing about the whole act of, you know, even drawing as a language, the whole thing of even the act of observation, that it aligns all the three realities you're composed of. So you have an individualistic reality, you have, you know, a societal reality, and you have a worldly transcendental reality, like who have people, like we have come to this place and we shall go. This, it's a non-negotiable truth. And between these three realities exist a lot, many conflicts. I want to be an artist, but maybe society discourages that, or, or maybe it's not easy. Uh, but the truth is, even if you become an artist, you just have one life for all the ideas. So you have, you're working in all these, you know, different, different belts of conflict and how you, it's not about, you know, choosing one over the other. It's how well you learn to navigate it, right? And uh, bringing one reality into the other, and that's only possible through Sorry, it's and that's only possible through. Uh, it's uh, and it's only possible through <clears throat> observation. And when you're observing something, you are also acknowledging it. It's you know, otherwise we just have labels for everything. You know, even in our family, uh, that's the name of my father, that's the name of my brother or sister. But who are they as people? And you know what they are. What are their deep, deeper uh, you know layers composed of? What are their aspirations and uh, you know, how is their relationship with life? And sometimes they open up and they tell you a story about or an incident or what they're frustrated by, what they're, you know, what they, what they in generally are feeling, right? So I think it starts from there. And I think uh, going back to why I went to the elephants, it was not from the purpose of research or trying to even understand. I just wanted to be there and, and see for myself what's going on because it's not a guarantee that they will, you know, sort of also invite you into the sacred space. It's a, it's a completely different being which operates differently. And, uh, you know, we've been spoiled by, you know, sort of <laughs> we've been conditioned by Disney films to expect it to be cuddly and to give you hugs if you do nice things to, to it. But that's not to be, that's not to, a lot of times that's, th those are the things I needed to, not I, but a lot of us need to unlearn. And, you know, just feel that connection, even by looking at an elephant and just doing work by maintaining that distance and just serving the elephant or serving anyone for that matter of fact, you know, whatever is your passion, whatever is your aspiration uh, and just being there for someone. I think that's the fundamental idea. I think just being there for someone uh, is that research. Uh, I don't know, but is that a window into life? And perhaps is that an extension into the poetry of life? I guess so. I would love to ask a process question because if many of the people in the audience are probably following you on Instagram at Abiart and in that mode, you're able to share images, but also you're able to share your writing, which people who have seen maybe transcendent deities in the gallery spaces haven't really come to know as well. How can you, when you come to a story, does it express itself clearly to you that it needs to be depicted visually or in writing? Is everything always a combination of the two? How do you make those decisions as an artist when you're approaching sharing some new content? Uh, I think now it's a lot more seamless uh, because uh, naturally I was drawing from the beginning. So writing is something I picked up a lot later. Um, and uh, again, I think for writing, you need like even for draw, uh, for art, if you are drawing, you need some proficiency with the with drawing things, you know, with translating what you see and making those choices with, you know, intersecting lines and shapes. So you're able to express what you're, you know, visually experiencing. Uh, I think the same is with, so investing some time in learning the craft, I think. Uh, and that's where I think I would just uh, go back to your last question of research as well, that you have, I think research would entail a lot of, uh, the research part would be uh, also learning about, you know, your craft. And uh, if uh, I'm interested in ancient wisdom literature, then it, it becomes a, not just a necessity, a responsibility to go back and, and, and seek from those books and seek from those, uh, you know, canons of literature, uh, not necessarily just, uh, you know, Indian, but very universal 
uh, in its uh, eclectic form. Uh, so go. Uh, so I went back and read a lot of mythology of different cultures and indigenous mythologies as well, indigenous uh, histories. Then from there, you of course these are stories, but they're talking about a political uh, kind of uh, layer. They have a psychological layer. They have maybe a fantastical layer, or you know, maybe a layer which you can connote somehow scientifically as well um, like science is quite open to delve into the questions of consciousness and if you really go back into the Upanishadic literature the Vedantic literature it's talking a great deal about you know consciousness and the nature of reality in general so you're trying to also learn from a lot of more prog progressive more modern movements of uh, intellectualism and knowledge um, so, and I think a lot of research is that so and that research I think I, I I, I started to do it out of curiosity, but eventually uh, I was just, you know, reading it because from a point of view, of when you kind of get into music and a lot of music you are listening to is the music you like. Uh, and you, you may not be making the music yourself, but you appreciate the music for what it is. And you, if you're into it, you may start to appreciate the deeper nuances, but you can't express it all the time, right? So I think with research for me, that is the relationship that I read. Uh, if I'm reading, uh, uh, whether it's an uh, ancient literature book, or if I read Ur Ursula Le Guin, I love the way she writes, or if I read, you know, a more modern poet, uh, and I go, my, this is such a beautiful way of expressing the world, you know, and why didn't I read it sooner? You know, it's, that's my first reaction in general. And when I, I think, go towards the elephant, I think a lot of this kind of takes a backseat. There's a beautiful line um, uh, in the Upanishads, which says, that people who are ignorant, uh, they live under darkness. That someone who does not know uh, would be slightly, you know, ignorant about things. So, and that's the kind of darkness of not knowing something. So, people who are ignorant live under darkness, but people who claim to know the truth live under a greater darkness. When you think you know, you know, it's like the first story that you know. The th what what do you want to share? And uh, as a, as uh, and Ganesha says, my knowledge, because. And, and that's an egoistic proposition because, you know, you're just a kid and you can go and just play with them, right? So, but, so knowledge and in, intellectual uh, things can sometimes get in the way. Uh, and a hands-on experience is a great way of uh, dismantling it. So you can now take all those parts and, and put it where they actually belong and not build a wall out of that intellectual, intellectualism. So I think working hands-on with the elephants and going to the mountains uh, and, and even teaching, you know, sometimes, you know, doing storytelling sessions with children, uh, you, <clears throat> you, you are completely out of those areas and it's a more experiential truth you are going through. And that's the anchor. That's my, that's my center. The experiential quality of life is my center. On top of that, I can, I can infuse, you know, an intellectual strand. I can infuse perhaps a creative strand, a fantastical strand. But the experiential nature of reality uh, of what I'm going through uh, it, because of this connection, uh, that is the center. That's the nucleus in some way. And it's different for everyone. That's why, you know, when you express it artistically, it's so it's it's myriad. It's 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 different. Right. So, uh, so coming back to a question of writing and and uh, whether I do it together or not, uh, I sometimes find myself in phases where I'm just writing. But I think I always keep doodling around the writing because I feel visuals are sort of a language in itself. They describe, at least to me, they describe a certain things which uh, I can compress in a visual. And sometimes I'm writing, so I don't have to spend time, you know, drawing every you know bit of that story. So it's it's definitely a mix. I can maybe uh, show uh, one another sketchbook here. So and this is. A, if you can hold it close to the camera, then yeah. the audience can see well the detail. Uh, so like, for instance, sometimes I'm, I'm drawing like this. This is a story I made around the mountains and like there are visuals and writing on top of each other or like a comic or a graphic novel. And then, uh, and it goes on for pages. It, this is very straight ahead kind of a way of uh, doing the work that you're in a flow and you just, knocking out these panels and writing on top of it and and, uh, and drawing. Abhi, this goes along with a question that's come from the audience uh, called and Precious. Then, can, you, can you hear me? 
Yeah, I can. Okay. Go ahead and describe this page. No, so this is a bit, bit of the research where, you know, some of the uh, neurological aspects and how the cross sections of the brain and the shapes and the hippocampus and the frontal cortex and the pineal gland uh, are expressed in ancient uh, symbolism. Uh, so a cu couple of these things and, uh, you know, you're kind of going into like writing a lot more things. Mm -hmm. The balance yeah. shifts. Yeah. And then it's just writing, you know. Yeah. So a lot of these pages just become a lot of writing and writing and writing for many pages. And I usually stop at this point and I get to the computer and write it there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel then if I'm in a zone where I'm just going to write, I usually shift digitally. Right. Shift over. Uh, yeah. It's, it's hard to do it when I'm, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, trekking or something that I'm writing and just drawing in a sketchbook. But it's right. both together. It's, it's both uh, always. We have a question I want to share with you from Kalpesh. Um, he's asked, uh, where, from where do you pick your subjects for the different projects or uh, mythological illustration books? And how long does it take for such books to develop, such as Krishna, A Journey Within? Can you talk a little bit about those? Uh, yes, the short answer to that is uh, from dreams. It's cliche an answer, but what keeps you awake in the night and what are you moved by? Because I don't think so. I started creating art because I had profound questions or, or I had a kind of like an intellectual side to me or any of those things. I think I was simply awed by the stories and something in me responded to it. And I think I'm just pursuing what was that which was responding to the story and finding a little bit of clarity about that thing and now I've stopped. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't matter, you see. It doesn't matter to uh, answer things, but it does matter to pursue something and see. And, and I sort of became a creature of depths that I like to go towards those depths, even though they might, the nitrogen will pressure my body and there's no oxygen. And I want to see, you know, I want to test the limits. You know, it's asking someone, why would you go to the Everest? There's not really a correct answer to that. Uh, and it's what you're driven by and how much of that uh, intention is, is, is moving you further along the way. Uh, I think those are the questions because why would a person spend four years, uh, you know, drawing and writing a book, perhaps in some very insignificant small capacity is linked to, the, to, the, to an idea of why people will fight for freedom and put their lives at stake or why anyone would go out of their way to help someone else. When you go out of your way for something, I guess somewhere or the other, deep down inside, perhaps it's a, it's maybe love and curiosity and some kind of in, innate wonder coalescing. So that's the uh, that's sort of a that's an individualistic uh, answer to it. Uh, in terms of a little more rational thought, it would it I I wanted to work on Krishna's theme because for me it. Uh, it uh, sort of brought together my, uh, you, it, it brings together many themes like history and poetry and culture and um, uh, philosophy. And uh, you can link it to even like very, very ancient literature. You can link it to Pink Floyd and Nostra Khan and my love for music and a little playfulness. And so it's, it, for me, it was learning about as many themes. So I did a book on Krishna. Four years, I was wanting to do eight volumes. I could only do one. Uh, and that remains, you know, this thing which you finished, but not not quite yet. Maybe at some point in my retirement, I'll go back to it. Um, and for Nama, it was uh, for all of the paintings. It has just been a more uh, open ended journey because I do not know what the next stop is. I myself, I'm discovering that in the process. Um, uh, it's more, I think, and it's also you can choose this but not be able to create this, you know? And I know a lot of people who even have, you know, just a, like a daily job and they live just a regular life and they come home and they create something for themselves. And that parallel life they're living, they are just simply doing it for soul's sake. Now, some of them, whether being artists, musicians, they may take sometimes a chance on that. And for some of them, it works out in the world. And for a lot of them, it, does not perhaps in the in the way they were expecting. Uh, I have been fortunate that for me it worked out just about enough so I can 
sustain it as a full time activity so i'm very fortunate for that but i've never taken to a model yet that i do this and i produce this much and i this is my process i want to constantly evolve so i guess when when i know about it a little more and when when i have come to a point where i can talk about this in clear cut like a in a way of a formula <laughs> <laughs> then then i can probably speak you know in short about it but right now it's just following a path which is prompting me to move constantly to see what's next and how can i connect with things around that's all i'm looking for i want to tell stories i i feel that mentally i'm not an artist so that <laughs> keeps me away from uh you know uh, somehow getting caught in a lot of those you know procrastinating webs and you know uh, kind of getting into this artistic delays uh, and romanticizing the creative process also because you know I, and and i'm just speaking for myself i'm not every artist is different so i want to be like it's not like you know putting a line on the line for uh, you know in a in a grave situation for someone else it's just an artistic process you're sitting and you're editing a film and you're sitting and making a picture i'm very fortunate i feel, i truly feel that you know i i when uh, you know someone says it's so difficult and this thing i think you have romanticized it to that degree mm-hmm. you know so i think i am constantly wanting to connect and and find those strands and and bring it into the story and in the art and see if it becomes a testament of this uh, journey in some way mm-hmm. what what christina is asking is that you know you and i talked about the title of today drawing as a language and this idea of the language of art we've also talked a lot about music but um she's asking not only the subject every stroke and color can convey or enhance meaning what do you feel you convey with your specific style of art um because i think people when they look at your work it very much presents itself as a unique expression that stands alone so what are you hoping to convey uh one thing which i'm consciously trying is to uh bring us all into a shared experience where we are celebrating our connection with nature and we are celebrating our connection with each other and we are sort of finding a moment of alignment even in a state of conflict there is there is that alignment which exists so uh at the same time uh ruminating about the dilemmas you know some you know it's saying when you have conflict and suffering it becomes uh with patience it becomes more endurable and with impatience it becomes more severe so when you have patience you can endure your suffering and conflict with a certain elegance it may not be an answer and may not go away but you will become a little aware of the the you know the ebb and flow of that conflict and the structure of that fear or the structure of that conflict in some way understand your place in it and understand uh the conflict itself in some manner or the other but if you if you don't have if you're not dealing it dealing with it with patience the impatience will accentuate its effect and then you're down this vortex which is kind of consuming and i think a lot of times for all of us at least for me stories and art and these very indirect sources which are somehow we are surrounded by you know there's nature there's human beings and then this one thing other than wars human beings have created which have this beautiful which connects us in an etheric way in an akashic way it connects us and it's somehow it's 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 through the stories and through this universal values which are embedded in those stories so i think it's a celebration of those universal values Uh, at the same time by not rejecting the state of the world by not rejecting the kind of uh, uh the dynamic quality of and the decay of the world and the and the dynamism of challenges uh, by not rejecting that by not by not painting a picture which is very utopian uh, but by bringing you closer into a field where you are empowered to take on these challenges as 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 part of life and 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 sort of source and draw that strength from this connection with nature in some way and you don't have to know the botanical names or anything like that but you know there is a certain beauty in nature let's say you know th- the things which are still they move towards things which are moving and the things which are moving they move towards things which are still a bird you know finds a plant and at the same time the plant is moving and i think we have sort of model 
our civilization in some or the other way by taking cues and hints from nature in many ways. Now, nature is not always benevolent. Nature is also quite indifferent and nature is quite hard. And uh, a tsunami is not choosing between honest and dishonest people and destroying them like that. Uh, so uh, the, it's, we are ruminating in some way through the shared experience. That's at least my intention about the nature of things, right? So th that'll be just an intention. And I think every artist does it differently. Uh, and for me, I'm doing it also a lot for my own, uh, as I said, uh, seeking that I myself am in a journey of seeking. And the thing is that we are all human beings. Somewhere or the other, we are very similar. And in, in many ways, culturally and, and, and non-culturally, maybe even emotionally, we may display a different palette. But I guess in some way we are, we are common. You know, we have a heart, we have a mind, and we all have seen a tree, and we all have seen the sky, and we uh, sort of walk. And, you know, we have heartbreaks and we all have gone through tragedies and we have had moments of happiness where we have forget things. We all have amnesia and we sort of all in it together, even though we may not feel so. And I think a story comes along every now and then to remind you that you're in it together, but you don't. But in a way where you may not have 20 people around you together, but in a spiritual sense, you're together. You're composed of this great, you know ethnic web around you and you can draw that strength in a certain or you can just ponder about the beauty of the world and just be in wonder for a moment you know just be aligned in some sense you know so that would be uh, but there are other things too to this if i may bring that one last point to this answer that is uh, any kind of alignment uh, a lot of uh, times when you're drawing and why i said drawing is a language or even music but drawing is one of the languages which brings you closer to silence you know, you may do music and, uh, you know, it's, it's creating sounds. You know, it sends ripples of a different nature across the etheric framework. And it's a very active and uh, very kin kinetic form in that way. Even when people are together, you can do music and you can jam and, you know, you can have a party with music. But there are very few things in life which bring you closer and give you a relationship with silence and solitude and solemnness. And drawing is one of those languages. Because what is really happening is that not just you are drawing something, but you're spending time in silence by not getting too restless too soon. And you are spending time not just observing something, uh, eventually it's building into a relationship of some sort even, and you can move to the next thing after that. But what it is doing to your body, mind, spirit mechanism is that it's bringing these three layers together and, your, and the benefits it has towards your parasympathetic nervous system, the benefits it has to your neurological activity, uh, the, the, the way your energy is, you know, uh, sort of coursing through uh, during this process is, is also slightly more aligned. And if you follow, uh, you know, if you follow a certain rhythm in your even in your drawing, and sometimes you're frantic and sometimes you're slower, but you follow, you bring a rhythm, like if you're breathing along with it in a way where, you breathe, where, where your breath and your uh, lines are aligned, like it's in music. When you sing a song, you need to take those breaths every now and then. So you're cueing your breaths and you're align, aligning your breaths with, with, by spotting those lines uh, in the process. And it becomes a very, uh, you know, activity of peace. It becomes an, a moment of calm, at least, if not peace. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, so hence, I think we have looked at drawing as an industrial thing. It's been in the service of industry. I want to be an animator at this place. I want to be an artist and I want to be successful. I want to be selling at a gallery. Sure. But somehow what I like about music that you, a lot of people do music without having the expectations of becoming a musician. And I think my, my attempt in some way is to encourage people to also draw and, you know, do that as an activity for yourself, for silence, because we need it so much. You know, we are just bombarded with so many things in the last two decades that we need to establish a relationship with silence. And you need to have someone helping you out. So just draw, you know. And then when you go and volunteer, you're connecting, you're putting yourself in a conflicting place. Perhaps you're kind of going and adding something constructive and you bring all that fodder back and you bring all those ideas back and you again build something in this very personal space along with silence. And I think that's a very beautiful loop to exist in. 
I think, um, you know, we've talked a lot about how difficult this current moment is globally. And I wonder, do you feel that all that's happened in recent months has impacted your creative process? Uh, and if so, what ways has it changed it or maybe not at all? And I'd love to sort of combine that with a question from the audience. Um, Varunya is asking, um, and she's, this is completely accurate, divine beauty always oozes out of every single one of your paintings. I'm always inspired by your creations. I would love to understand what are your sources of inspiration for them. So this idea of, you know, has your process changed recently? And can you talk a little bit more about um, a source of inspiration? Uh, I, so when the, the drawing is emanating from me, let's say uh, I draw with my right, uh, I can draw very crudely from my left, but definitely I can't draw from my feet, right? So even though the ability to draw is inside me, somewhere exists inside, you know, the network of my mind or whatever, it courses through in a way where it, it sort of comes out of the right hand because somehow the right hand has, you know, has been in the process of seeking to understand that energy and then coordinate itself in a manner. So it spots the line and that's in sync and alignment with my observation in some way. So my mind and my hand and my eyes and, and, you know, the whole body in some way is expressing that energy. So it's uh, harmonized in the manner I'm intending. Uh, but what happens when that energy, which comes from somewhere else and then, you know, takes, uh, uh, takes and, and sort of comes inside you and from here, from the head, maybe it's charting its course like a river and coming out of the bends of your fingers. If you look at it in a quantum way, all those cells which are carrying the information, all those atoms which are carrying the information of this, this energy information are dying and re-emerging in that millisecond. You know, so a grandfather cell passes this legacy to, the, to his son and, he, and that father to his son. And so on, the energy moves within this very millisecond loop, which is happening right in this very moment, even when we speak, actually. And somehow they are orchestrating themselves. These atoms are orchestrating themselves with the atoms of the environment. Now, why are the atoms of the environment are coming together to orchestrate dance with these atoms? We don't know. They don't owe me anything. But somehow in, in that Akashic framework, in that etheric framework, this photonic dance is happening. And this subtle conversation is happening. And I am perhaps not just witnessing it, I'm also participating in it. And I'm letting myself be completely open. And even when you scratch a line across that board, this is happening. Perhaps with less intention than when you create something with intention. It could be just a circle. It doesn't have to be a beautiful looking thing. It could just be a simple shape. But very, when you're intending, these atoms which are carrying the energy emanating, coming out of the vents of your fingers, dancing with the atoms of the environment, you know, you are part of that conversation now, something so subtle, which can only be experienced. Isn't that wonderful, a miraculous thing in itself? I cease at this point, I cease. And I don't have my senses, I don't have anything in this moment. I am completely that atom, I'm also this body, but I'm none of these things in that way. And when this is done, when I come out of this trance, uh, whatever this immersiveness is, uh, it's not that I become forgetful in the process, but when I come out of this trance, I have nothing but gratefulness in my heart. And I, I have become so much more humbled in the process because I have never looked at art in a very rigid way. It's not a rigid thing. Sure, you can read a History, art history book and learn a great deal about ancient artists and everything. But I feel nature in, in, in itself is an art, uh, you know, is an artist or a musician. And I'm so inspired from the tradition of uh, the women art traditions in India, the folk art traditions from India. You know, it's that they make something in the morning. Uh, these storytellers, uh, these, uh, you know, all the women in my life, I know my even my grandmother would make something in the morning. I've seen in villages, these women folk make something without any attachment to it, you see. They just make it and by evening it's dust and it's gone. Even the mo monolithic structures car carved out of a stone, you know, which is the art of men and art of women is, you know, the things they draw on the wall. And, but even that vanishes and withers away. 
the the atomic state changes after 1000 years but that 1000 years is condensed into that you know five hours on that day of the festival when you know a woman artist just draws this beautiful flower on the wall and that flower withers away by evening that's exactly life that's a beautiful symbol so do it with this level of reverence and and go closer to something but you can't really go closer to answers you can only go closer to experience of some sort now if all of this personal thing somehow trickles into the world and some people buy what you do and other people pay f- to have a gallery exhibition and you somehow you know are able to uh, find a footing into this uh, and have a little bit of what you do in this manner with this intention and have this trickle into the jagatyam jagat the sansara the world the matrix uh that's another level of being fortunate but then your responsibility is not to identify with that but to identify always with this experiential truth and if tomorrow the art ceases to exist and tomorrow no one buys it or i'm not able to sustain as an artist or i lose my interest in doing art i have come to a point when i can say to myself it's okay i'll go and be a caretaker to an elephant it's okay it's wonderful to whatever time it passes through me i'm grateful you know so it's it's really that realization the the birth and death is not in your hands but you know it's going to happen and it can happen in any time so while i get up every day and i know that this is there i not just want to create a good piece but i want to be of use to something too but if not use i want to just say a thank you to the sky i want to say thank you to you know like i i don't think i'm making this by myself i think all the five elements are making this with me the elephants are making it and it sounds crazy it sounds stupid and, but i want to be that kid when i make it you know i do not want to lose that that you know sort of connect to this innocence of this imagination this this realization right and and that's really all which my work is in its in its uh, philosophy this is all what it is you know so and this is where i seek my inspiration and all those other questions anyone is asking everything is inspiring like a little plant cracking through the concrete is inspiring you know a leaf on the ground is inspiring everything is inspiring you don't have to go to the himalayas although if you can go to the himalayas go and yeah. spend some day in silence <laughs> you know it is going to open you differently yeah. you know go help someone go volunteer with someone those are the things which inspired me i don't think so uh, that only art books and you know an education in art inspired me i think it extended my experience but true inspiration has always come from these very raw sources which perhaps may not fit into the artistic bracket so to speak right. but the art the, in, the knowledge about artistic traditions will extend your craft and your your ability to express it your ability to dive deeper into it you know you can hold your breath a little longer <laughs> when you take a dive in the ocean so because yeah sure you know on those on those levels I, it's painful to me that our time together today is so limited. Um, but I wonder, would you be willing to shift slightly from the questions from the audience to perhaps do a little sketching um, so that people can sort of see your practice unfold? Yeah, absolutely. So I have, uh, let me, uh, although let's, uh, these, so my stand was basically these books. Uh, yeah, I can show you some of the, this is the brother aruna ke upanishad the book of the forest is an upanishad this is when the world becomes female a beautiful book written about the goddess traditions in india matsya puran a lot of sketchbooks here a lot of sketchbooks here this is another elephant sketchbook uh i was sitting uh, almost i think 15 meters from them mm. and every day i would go sit and sometimes i would not draw sometimes i would draw this is when they were putting the medicine on the elephant's ear they had just rescued her mm. Yeah. 
this was a very, very beautiful elephant he passed away recently his name is gajraj and this is his caretaker who had vowed that he would never tie him ever again and even if he kills him it's okay hmm. his chances of getting hit by a car are higher in india hmm. uh so uh, a lot of these uh, so i'm going to show something else if i can here these are all the sketches i couldn't <laughs> i couldn't finish uh, yeah and yeah this is this is their enclosure inside this is right in the morning and are you always starting the sketch straight in ink it depends a lot of these sketches uh for instance i'll show this a lot of this stuff i i don't post or anything like these are made these were made while i was walking with the elephant mm. and these sketches were made when they so these elephants are still working and they work to give these rides in this fort and you can't take pictures and photographs so for the long time the guy, people that couldn't you know they just thought i was just drawing or making notes in my sketchbook but when they came and saw i was actually drawing you know the elephant <laughs> being ready for the ride they actually asked me to stop mm. because they don't want anyone to go back with any proof mm-hmm. uh, and i did this while i was standing and walking with the elephant uh, they're getting ready so this is very much on the spot and some of them were like this is when the elephant was just outside eating mm. yeah i don't know if you can see something like this this is when the elephant yeah you can't see it here but but yeah so this is a little bit of a glimpse into that you're not holding back yourself to make a pretty picture but you're just bringing down some information of the scene mm-hmm. and perhaps composing it uh and making sure that what you want to wanted to say is is said in a minimalistic way uh and you move on to the next picture uh it's it's very much on the go so you have to improvise a lot when you are because this it's what you're doing is looking at a very high definition reality and bringing it down in a more composed way and selecting your lines and shapes so that process of observing and what you want to actually draw that is uh, very much in the moment it's, it's it has to be almost a quick response to things you don't have much time mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean you have you don't have time at all you know so this is that so let's see if we can <laughs> quickly <laughs> do a drawing uh, this is, let's see uh Okay let's see can you can you see the brush and and the ink yes. is just yes i we can see well it's mm. just a waterproof ink with just a very basic brush actually this brush is broken i've cello taped it <laughs> so like no i won't let you go that easy right that was this. it still has life yet in it uh, all, all all these things are alive you know in some way mm. and okay let's see quickly so um okay let's see if i can 
can't pull this off in record time. <laughs> it's going to be just an expression of the story I, 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 I told. And I think it will be done. Fantastic. Very soon. And it's Abhi, can you pan the camera up slightly so we can yeah, sorry, see? Yeah. Okay.
this is a perfect demonstration of you doing both sides of the storytelling, starting with the story spoken at the beginning of today and then showing us the drawing of the story at the end. Yeah, I think it was uh, sort of when I finished the story, I thought if I would draw and well, if you would remember that I was supposed to you draw, I was thinking if you don't say it, maybe I can skip it. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's always a tempting offer because I can I get to like into it then. So I'm grateful as well that I can do the story and it's yours for and mounting think, such an incredible exhibition. Uh, <laughs> so this is like my thank you to you, honestly. You are too, too generous and kind. The, I know that I speak for the audience when I say uh, we owe you a huge debt of gratitude for allowing us to at least peek over your shoulder today. What a treat for all of us and what a nice start to the nine nights. No, and thank you for everyone for coming in and joining in. At, uh, I know in, in India it must be very, very late. So thanks to everyone for joining in at this very odd hour. And thank you, Bridget, for being so patient. Uh, and thank you just everyone at Carlos Museum. You know, Elizabeth, thank you for making this happen. And thank you, Bridget, for making this happen. happen. Thank you, Alana and Chris and everyone uh, in the team and just a big, big, big thank you and gratitude to everyone. Uh, so I think this is done. I'll leave it here. Okay. okay. This is sort of the painting. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you for allowing us to sort of be there as it came into being. And, and thank you also for staying up so late yourself. Uh, <laughs> The, t the time zones are not on our side, but uh, speaking on behalf of the audience, we're deeply grateful for your time and your attention this afternoon. No, you're most welcome. And as I said, lots and lots of thank you. And uh, thank you again to everyone at uh, Asia Society, Texas, uh, Houston, and uh, everyone at Carlos Museum. It's very, very humbling. And thank you for making the stories travel. So thank you. That's our goal. That is absolutely our goal. And um, for those of you who are in the audience and you'd like to see more programming like this, please stay connected with us through our various channels. And um, if you would like to support more programming like this, I think we'll have the links for you in the chat box. Um, and we hope to see Abhi back in Houston again very soon when we can all travel and be together in person. But for the time being, we're delighted that this was possible. And um, thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us. Have a great rest of your day or your evening, depending on where you are. Thanks again mm -hmm. so much. Thank you. <laughs>